Today, we're taking it back to the beginning of the Pokédex, and we're going to see how Bulbasaur would look in a Pokémon Red solo challenge. After several runs with optimizations, I'm going to plug in the final time and the resets, and we'll get to see Bulbasaur's tier card and ultimately see how it stacks up against its Generation 1 counterparts. If you need detailed rules, check out the description, but the basics are that I can only use Bulbasaur in battle, I can't use items in battle, and the TMs for Double Team and Toxic are banned, but grab yourself a Sodi Pop and let's just dive into it. Bulbasaur is universally liked, but it was actually a pretty frustrating run, and I'd go as far to say that I didn't particularly enjoy my first playthrough of this Pokemon, and before we look into the information to explain that a little bit more, let's just look at this first rival fight. Keep in mind this is the tutorial little baby battle, and it's not great. The idea here, growl once, hope for the best, but Charmander is just kind of like superior in every way. It's faster, it hits harder, and it has an upgrade with Scratch. Better in every single way than Tackle. This is not, this is far from a guaranteed battle, and this is one of those runs where you would just kind of like restart if you lost, but you're gonna see here that I barely survived by the skin of my teeth, and this is just like a little nibble, a little bitty taste into some of the underlying problems for the run in general. Now that we're beginning our journey proper, we can bring up that information. Let's start with the stats. They're not great, but that's not really unexpected for a base stage Pokemon. All but one of these stats are in the 40s, but it is what it is, and there's not really much to say about it other than it really doesn't help us out a whole lot. The level up moves is where most of my gripes come from, specifically with Tackle. I'll go into it more as the video progresses, but you have to solely rely on this move a lot, and everything that's even pretty good is kind of held off into the later levels. Sleep Powder is kind of the worst culprit here. It's at a very steep level 41, but when you look at very similar Pokemon like Bellsprout, it gets Sleep Powder at level 18, and it makes you wonder why. Maybe they thought Bulbasaur and its entire line would be too strong with an early Sleep Powder? What do you guys think? As for the TMs, it's pretty basic. And coverage, that's not a word that Bulbasaur knows. All the damaging moves today are gonna be either normal or grass, but there are at least a couple of standout TMs that will elevate our little Bulby boy. Swords Dance and Body Slam, it's kinda like peanut butter and jelly, and let's just say that Bulbasaur, he's gonna have a lot of sandwiches before this one's over with. So we started off a little shaky in the tutorial battle, but what about the first actual battles? In terms of a threat to knock us out or force a reset, you can see that the first Bug Catcher, it does some damage here and there, but when you got Leech Seed, you aren't in any real danger. But the highlight here, what I wanna focus on, is just how long it actually takes. The first Bug Catcher is bad enough, but when you get to that second Bug Catcher, he has a Kakuna, and it really stalls things out. If you're thinking about this, glass half full, it's that I don't have to use early potions despite being a little bit low. With Kakuna raising its defense and reducing my already weak tackles to nothing, Leech Seed just keeps ticking and it starts to add up. I'm getting some health back, we're pretty safe here, and there's not anything overly interesting about these battles. I just really need to paint a picture of how bad tackle feels to use. We are a grass type and that's really good for Brock, but the short term problem right now is that we don't get a grass move until level 13. In Viridian Forest, it only contains enough experience to get us to level 10, and I think you guys know what that means. It's time for some Most of you know the drill by now, trainers give 50% more experience over wild battles, so by taking this quick 190 experience from knocking out the Diglett and then letting the Sandshrew knock you out, you have a repeatable source of experience that's much faster than the alternative. Bulbasaur does have to use Growl to get by the Diglett at the start of this grind, but it is doable and that's the really important thing. Something else I haven't mentioned is that I, I completely redesigned the overlay, and I'll touch on some new features here and there if I remember to, but let's kind of start with the Sandshrew. It's got that dreaded sand attack in Pokemon Red, so you're gonna see me get hit with the sand attack here. And finally, after years of doing this video and talking about sand attack, I can actually visually show you guys a percentage number of how it feels to get sand in your eyes. I get hit with two here and you can see that the accuracy is going to change but when it's less than 50% it's going to turn red. That indicates my rage of just having so much sand dumped on me and while that's not interesting to everyone, I love this little change here. I love that I was able to code it in. Overall I guess the main thing is that it's just visual like from a viewer perspective and the ultimate goal for me was readability just to make it look nice, clean, visually stimulating. So feedback is welcome. I would love to hear what you think about it. But on the back end of things, I cleaned up 
put thousands of lines within the code. I added a bunch of stuff and it was just a big project. Now, if you are interested in that kind of stuff or other aspects, or you just want to hear me talk about it, I suggest watching the Growlithe stream I did recently. I take a lot of time to talk about aspects of the overlay, parts of the code as I was putting them in, and we just kind of put it through a stress test, but I don't want to talk about this all day, but I felt like I had to at least bring it up because it's kind of a big change. At the end of the day, we don't have to black out grind very long here. Vine Whip is at level 13, but I do need to go one over that. I'm about halfway through the level, and with that, we can take a quick look at Brock. I guess it's just tradition to show the first gym leader's card, but we all know it's kind of like a farce. It's really not needed. With Vine Whip, this is just a matter of two easy one shots. I didn't have to heal. And even if the Onyx does its absolute worst, like critting on a tackle here, this one's just over quick. Bulbasaur already on its way. We've seen some shortcomings already kind of rear their head early in the run, and after a standard Route 3 we can kind of pick up in Mount Moon. I pick up some easy optionals here, we got Fan Favorite Super Nerd, then we got the Double Grass Lass, and then we got the Hiker for some really easy experience, but I do opt to take on the Raticate Grunt today. This is the very first risk of the run, and the idea here, let's get a little cutesy. I'll toss out a couple of growls, it won't do any damage, I'll set up a Leech Seed, I'll be perfectly safe, and this idea always sounds really good in my head but it never plays out well. It sets up some tail whips, I start to get really beat up, and I think if it wasn't for poor move selection by the AI, I probably would have lost here. And you're going to see lots of little mistakes like this in the video, but I'll get to why this is the run that I decided to go with despite that very soon. Now, Mount Moon's not done, we're going to focus on the mandatory rocket grind. How often do we talk about this one? We had a run like Oddish a little bit ago, it had to completely swap versions to yellow because it doesn't have a mandatory Zubat here, and Leech Life is a is a hassle, and Gen 1 Bug is super effective against Poison, and that, with our Grass Topping, it means that we're double weak to it, and it just, it wasn't a fun time if you're not, if you're not prepared. Just like with Raticate, I originally wanted to use Growl and kind of like over-engineer this fight, but using Occam's Razor, the simplest solution was to go straight tackle and just hope for the best, and it works out here. Hitting level 20 going into the Zubat wasn't a happy accident, and that extra damage from the damage rounding threshold, it was key because you saw that we still got a little bit low anyway. So as I wrap up Mount Moon, we're going to defeat the Super Nerd and we're going to go into Cerulean. But I would like to take this time to talk about split data. And you might be wondering, hey, why would you hold off into that until now? The first is that sweet retention time. You want, you want to think about the flow of the video. You got to balance the gameplay. You don't want to be throwing too much information at your audience's head and having them lose interest. And the second is just like the overlay, I kind of, I've overhauled solo run split data a little bit. Let's pull it up. The usual stuff here, you can see we got Brock, the split time, the time difference between the last split, those are the same as always. But there's one new metric at the end and I'm, I'm calling it tier pace right now. I'm going to refine this more over time, but for this run, the last column represents how close I am to a certain tier. For this run, I went with C tier and each predetermined split that it's comparing against, it's going to add up to be right out about 70 out of 100 on the tier card, assuming that you have about five resets. We can see here that Bulbasaur is already two minutes and 40 seconds behind that pace. And this little change here, it came about through viewer feedback. I agreed with some of you that this felt a little bit incomplete, and a little bit hollow, because what's the point of split data if you're not comparing it against something? And now we can kind of see how a Pokemon is competing for a spot in a certain tier as we progress to the run. And I just think it's really cool. And once again, I probably talked about this a little more on the Growla stream, but this right here is easily the most sophisticated code that I have for my channel. And I just think data is always pretty neat. Now in the background, I've shown some battling those two trainers in Misty's gym, and it goes without saying that we do have a great matchup here, so let's take a quick look at Missy. I just said great matchup, but this one isn't as cut and dry as you might think. I play this one a little risky as well, and I don't heal because I don't think I need to. And if her Pokemon get a little crit happy, you can easily lose. Now, once again, guys, I use two Growls and Leech Seed. It never works out, and this one becomes a lot closer than it should have. But if you've noticed, I brought that up a couple of times. I just, I kept falling for that trap. It sounds so good in my head. Use some Growls, set up Leech Seed, you'll start to outpace. But it's 
not that good. It hasn't cost me a reset yet, but I am I'm flirting with it. I'm practically begging a reset to come bite us right now. But we get it done. I guess that's the important thing. The extra battles plus Misty do get us to level 23, and that's really important because believe it or not, what I consider to be the toughest battle in the entire run is coming up next. Low base stats, combined with Tackle being the only real answer for the problem, it made me scratch my head a lot, but I felt like this was kind of the best that it really could get, so I guess we just gotta take a look at rival number two now. The big problem with this fight isn't Sand Attack, it's Tackle. Sand Attack is just a product of Tackle being so bad. Now level 23, the first thing it does here is it lets you outspeed Pidgeotto, and it actually gives you a chance, but it takes so many Tackles to take this thing down, it's almost inevitable. The reason I picked this run overall, when we see everything through until the very end, is because I don't get hit with Sand Attack here. It takes me about 13 tackles to take this thing down, sure, but it never uses Sand Attack, and I've never seen this in any of my practice runs or tests for this. This is the only time this happened, so I was gonna take it and I was gonna run with it. Since it does go straight damaging moves, that means we get pretty low. We're in the yellow health, but thankfully, for the one time in this run, Leech Seed is actually great. Abra only has teleport. It can't do anything against us, so what I'm gonna do here, this is gonna be very slow. I'm gonna toss a Leech Seed on it, and I'm pretty much gonna use Growl. I'm gonna let Leech Seed tick every turn. I'm not gonna manually attack, and I'm gonna use Abra as kind of like a pseudo potion, I guess. Kind of like leftovers. This is gonna get me back up to 54 HP. I'm looking pretty healthy. And grass moves, they're really not good early in the game, but against something like Rattata, it'll do the job just fine. I can take it out. I even crit just for good measure to make it as painless as possible. And at the end of the day, we have Charmander. Now, thankfully for this fight, the rival doesn't have good AI yet, so it won't go straight Ember, which means we have more than a chance here. We actually take the battle. It goes for scratch. And you can see that when it does use Ember, it doesn't do that much. And we take this one a little bit slow but no resets not seeing a sand attack it was a very rare occurrence and i'm happy to see it so as for nugget bridge there's not much you can do single highest cluster you already know you want to make this as fast as possible but bulbasaur just it simply can't i'm not going to keep showing split data a lot but i would like to say that after the misty split the time pace did increase even further so we're now three minutes and 27 seconds behind so it's looking like at this point on it looks like Bulbasaur would be in the D tier and there's no reason to look at every battle on Nugget Bridge but we will just kind of let it play forward a little bit here and we'll go into the Nugget Lasses who have Pidgeys and we're actually going to see Sand Attack it's not great we've already seen how it affects the accuracy on the overlay but something I didn't talk about was how I did stage modifiers they're not always visible and you're going to see when I get hit with the Sand Attack over where I keep the crit rate you're going to see a red one obviously red's going to be negative if, when it shows green later in the run it's going to be positive. That was a little bitty change as well. If I do something to the enemy like growl it, you'll see the same thing on their side of the stat screen. You can also see the hurt Bulbasaur sprite. I drew a lot of little hurt marks and stuff to put on it just to upgrade it a little bit, but let's not talk about that too much. Nugget Bridge is pretty standard, but it is a little bit slow. But before we take it down to Vermilion, I would like to talk about the Dig Rocket Grunt. I bring this one up even in like really high tier runs like Mewtwo or our current fastest run on the channel, Alolan Nine Tails. The Drowsy has Hypnosis and it can just waste a lot of time, but in Bulbasaur's case where it's not very good anyway and it's weak to Psychic, you gotta just roll the dice and just whatever happens happens because you can't do much about it just like nugget bridge you can't really speed it up all you can do here is just hope that it doesn't use confusion too much that alone isn't really the problem you could probably still outpace it but if it uses hypnosis it's pretty much a done battle but just like rival number two we get a pretty fortunate battle but the headaches and kind of planning around this kind of stuff it's, it's worth bringing up and speaking of bringing up we got to talk about the triple pidgey junior trainer the things to really know about this fight is Sand Attack is on the table for all three Pokemon. You would need to be about level 28 to have Tackle be in a two-shot range, but you don't really want to waste that much time. So just like a few battles that we've recently talked about, you just kind of got to let it happen. Hope for the best, and this one doesn't play out well. It's actually very painful. I'm at 47% Tackle accuracy by the time I even get through with the first Pidgey, and it's just a slog. I don't lose, thankfully, but this was one of those battles that you really had to think about with Bulbasaur, and it's one of the huge reasons why it was so frustrating. I think this, for me, 
along with maybe rival number two, this is where tackle, it felt the worst to play. And there were moments where you were kind of routing the run where you thought maybe, man, I'm going to have to grind like two, three, four extra levels to even make this consistent. But the one good thing here is I hit level 27 after the fight. We get access to Razor Leaf, and I guess I should mention it real quick. Really good move, high crit rate, you already know about those. But they're only a guaranteed crit in Gen 1 if you have over 64 base speed, 64 or above. We have 45. It means that Razor Leaf will crit 70% of the time, but just like we've seen with the Reggie Alecky run, it is going to let you down a good bit in the run, but it's it's still good. It's worth mentioning. And while down on the SSN, I can just I can keep talking about Razor Leaf. It's so much better than Tackle, even when it's resisted, like here on this Nidoran on the guy guarding the Body Slam TM. You much prefer to use Razor Leaf over Tackle. Even if it didn't have the high crit chance, it would still do more damage than Tackle. Tackle's bad. I would rather have Takedown over Tackle. There, I said it. And I, I can't stress enough, guys, how good it felt to finally get Body Slam here. The fact that in tandem, almost back to back, we got Razor Leaf, then Body Slam. It really kind of flipped Bulbasaur over from being like a Pokemon that's like clawing and scraping its way just to barely peek into the C tier to something that can be a little bit better than that. We'll just have to see as the video goes on, but it felt really good to get Body Slam. It's a huge help. And kind of keeping up with the theme of this run of talking about little things we don't talk about much, we got to talk about the gentleman guarding the rare candy. I think you kind of know where this is going. So we got Body Slam, we do good damage, but it's not enough just to easily breeze through the fight. So we take out the Growlithe, and this trainer doesn't have good AI. It, Ponyta's just bad, it only knows Ember. And I brought this up in a video before, but getting burned right here feels so bad. I just don't bring it up a whole lot because it just doesn't happen. I would say once every few months maybe, and you gotta think that I make four or five videos a month, and within each video, I'm doing like three or four runs each. So it just doesn't happen much. And this forces you to use the full restore that you find going down to Vermilion. So it kind of puts you behind in that aspect as well. And it's just like another one of those little things that kind of went wrong with the run. But how lucky we got in fights like rival number two really offset that. But enough of that. We need to talk about rival number three. And I took another pretty big risk in this one as well. This is the next risk of the run. The huge improvement obviously is going to be tackle. I got rid of tackle. I didn't even keep it. Two body slams will take out Pidgeotto. It means it only has one chance to use sand attack. We don't see it here. Great. Fantastic. I'll be happy if we never see another sand attack for the rest of time. So I progress through the fight, but I do take damage. I'm about half health. And the risk I took is that I don't outspeed Kadabra. Thankfully, it can pick teleport. That's what it does. So I pretty much get a freebie here. The risk doesn't cost me. But at the end of the fight, this rival now has good AI. It'll only go for Ember. One body slam does put it in retroactive potion range, which is great, which means we just win the fight. But even if it got off an Ember, I still think we could have survived. But mainly the Kadabra outspeeding us, having that confusion, high crit rate. It could have been a problem, but just like rival number two, we make it through. Great. Keeping the pace going straight into Lieutenant Surge. We just have a great matchup here. I don't even heal, and I have my choice. Razor Leaf and Body Slam are both pretty good. I go for Razor Leaf on the weaker Pokemon, and I go straight Body Slam on Raichu. Despite missing a good chunk of health already, tanking multiple Thunderbolts and Thundershocks, I still hang on. And it feels good that this one's so comfortable after kind of struggling a little bit up to this point. And I feel like learning the new moves, hitting up some levels, and kind of getting past those struggle points, this is where Bulbasaur ultimately starts to turn the corner. And this is where I like the run a lot more. And I'm not going to keep bringing up split data, but I will talk about it just because we're on that C tier pace. It's a very important metric. I feel like we were three and a half minutes in the hole after Misty. And even with tackle, we were able to make up a lot of time on the Lieutenant Surge split. So at this point, Bulbasaur is pretty much dead even with that pace. It's actually about 36 seconds ahead. So we'll see kind of how that holds up. There's no reason to look at Rock Tunnel. It's incredibly easy. And instead, we can just pick right back up in Celadon. I decide to take on the Rocket Hideout first. I'm gonna grab a PP up in here. Just because there's a couple of parts where only 15 body slams isn't enough to make it through without having to make an extra trip or maybe use an elixir or something like that. So it helps. And it's worth noting that Erica is a 100% free matchup. And you might be wondering, why not go there first, get the levels? And the answer to that is I can just come here. It's really easy. Nothing's hard about it. And even though Erica might be free, it takes a long time because her Pokemon are just higher level. I think this is the overall faster route. And the only real problem here comes in the Giovanni fight. You wouldn't think that we would talk about the Giovanni fight for a grass type 
map because the first two Pokemon are just going to be little cakewalks. They're times four weak to grass. Get them out of here. Nothing worth really mentioning. I do hit 34 after those. I get the chance to learn growth and I don't. Growth is a fantastic move. Raising your special is really good. But it just comes down to the fact that Razor Leaf is our, easily our best choice and crits will ignore stat changes so it just doesn't help. If anyone out there has found like a different method or a use for it, I'm all ears. But for me, I don't need it. But the problem for this fight to get back to it is Kangaskhan. Look how much damage this bite does. Now thankfully it just locks itself into Rage after and I can take it out. But Kangaskhan's a menace. I can't wait to do that run in Generation 2. But let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. Let's just jump straight into Erica. And the reason this one is so free is because of good AI and our grass topping. She will only spam poison powder on the victory bell and it just makes it free. I just wanted to be at this level 35 damage rounding threshold just to make it quicker. The only thing kind of immune to that is the absolutely pathetic Tangela. But funny story, in practice, it used Constrict, dropped my speed, and Perma bonded me down to zero, and it was very frustrating to see. Thankfully, we don't see it here. I actually, if you want to know how much I respect Tangela, I actually use Resisted Razor Leaves just to make sure something didn't happen and I didn't run out of body slams. You can see it still does pretty good damage. But at the end, it's just Vile Plume. Same story there. It's going to go for Poison Powder until it dies, and it's just a free badge, and that's the best kind of badge, I think. And I think this is this and maybe one more time I'm going to bring up split data without actually showing it. It's because I think it's like an interesting dynamic to see where we're at. And Bulbasaur has been clawing its way back. And very similar to like Dodrio through this part of the game, Bulbasaur is now 7 minutes and 14 seconds ahead of pace. So it's made up a huge amount of ground and things are looking really good. But now we got to go into Pokemon Tower and we can take a look at rival number 4. Not a whole lot to say, but just to save time, I, you saw me use Razor Leaf in the Erica fight. It was to kind of preserve body slams. And while you wish you had more and you wish you could just let loose and just body slam everybody, this was just the best way to save a little time. And when you break it down, there's so many threats on the rival team for Bulbasaur that you need to use body slam on. You can get Sand Attack by the Pidgeotto, a Hypnosis on the Execute, Heavy Confusion Damage from the Kadabra, Gyarados has Dragon Rage, Super Effective Fire Damage at the end of the fight. It's really just, I manage it well. We get through it. We're just lucky that he's a lower level. But that's not even like the most interesting part about the tower. Now this is going to be just some grade A foreshadowing and we got to take a look at the channelers. So we're going to see here a great opening. What you want to do is have two Razor Leaves crit and it, it works out fine. We crit, it does a lot of damage, but we get lit and we get paralyzed. And what this is going to do is start a downward spiral of death that our little Bulbasaur just isn't ready for. Missing turns due to paralysis, taking nightshade damage, little lick chip damage, and confused ray hurting herself. It's just, it adds up. It's really not good. And you need to know right now that Bulbasaur does not have a great answer for ghost types. And I wouldn't say you need to get lucky to win these battles. I would say that you need to not be unlucky. And right here, we get unlucky, and we're gonna see the very first reset of the run. And it might sound surprising, but this is one of the worst parts of the game for Bulbasaur, honestly. It's just kind of frustrating because you can see on the next attempt that we're successful at, we don't really take any status. We don't hurt ourselves. They pretty much go straight nightshade and we get really low down into the red health despite everything, getting pretty much exactly how we want. But this first channeler here is so bad because she has two ghastlies. The other one's not too bad, but Pokemon Tower actually getting some video time this week. Good job, Pokemon Tower. You did it. There's no reason to look at the Safari Zone. We do the full everything. We get all the vitamins, we get the full restore, we get the final HMs of the run, and we can just take a look at buying now or one sell it on Mart buy. The things to really note here is I get a Pokey Daw to pick up Mimic later. I pick up some extra potions because Bulbasaur just gets slapped around a lot. I also get every single TM in here just so I can sell for more money. And as for the vitamins for the run, we pick up five Carbos because speed's gonna be pretty much our biggest problem. And then I pick up a couple of protein just to help out just that little extra damage amount on stuff like Body Slam later. And now we're gonna transition into what we've done on the channel a couple of times, what I like to call a half sylph. I do some of these standard things like go pick up the Carbos and the Rare Candy on the 10th floor, then I follow the traditional path to get the Card Key on the 5th floor. I pick up the Protein there as well, but the big prize, like you probably could have already guessed, is Swords Dance. 
Even though our only physical move we're going to be using for the entire run is Body Slam, Swords Dance. It makes a Pokemon that, you know, it Body Slams something and it goes, haha, that tickles to make him Bulbasaur hit like a Mike Tyson in his prime punch. To say it's a game changer would be an understatement. Now there are two additional battles that we need to pick up here. And I just go ahead and I pick them up on the third floor just to make the backtracking here a little bit quicker. It's worth noting that on the first grunt here, it's the double eradicate hypno grunt. I do set up two times just to make this a little bit easier because hypno is pretty scary when you're weak to psychic. You never know what it's gonna do. So just, if you can help it set up, just one shot it. I also pick up the scientist. It's the one near the hyper potion, right near the rival number five warp. Those two things help us get into an experience range for later because in a run like this where you're weak, you have a little bit of a badge boost going on, setting up your experience and hitting certain levels and leveling up at the right time. It's one of the most important things in the entire run. And this is like our first step to kind Kind of make the dominoes fall where we want them to going into that late game. Now that the half sylph is over, we're gonna go to Koga's gym. And I held off, I did the half sylph for this run. It's very similar to Erica actually. Koga's a very free fight. There's almost no way he can win. But the problem is that Koga just randomly has psychic types in his gym and getting swords dance makes it a lot easier. We've talked about turn economy and just making things take the least amount of time. And that does apply here, but it's also safety because we can just one shot things. And in a battle like this first juggler, only the Kadabra really gets a chance at you but the half sylph does just make things a little bit more safer things just a little bit more fast and honestly like when you're doing like a speed run like what's more important than those two things if you really think about it now at level 41 we're not going to see this in the footage i'm just going to show this one battle level 41 sleep powder sleep powder is so important we'll talk about it soon outside of spore 75 percent accurate sleep inducing move really solid also worth quickly mentioning that i pick up the two optional tamers in the gym as well just for some experience remember we're setting ourselves up for later they're very easy to take out but let's just dive into koga and get ourselves another one of those uh free badges and this one's identical to erica our grass topping means he will only go for poison moves which means there, it's just not nearly as much of a threat as it usually is there is one concern slightly and that smoke screen actually let me let me look it up real quick is smoke screen a poison move it's not actually smoke screen's a normal move so there's no risk in this fight actually i spent this whole run routing around it thinking that smoke screen would lower your evasion and make it hard i guess i was thinking like fern gully the little toxic ooze that's what i was thinking of when i think of smoke screen but let's not get sidetracked too much two sword stance it'll let you one shot the coughing everything else is a two shot he will not do anything annoying like explosion or lower your accuracy free fight speed badge boost it set you up really nicely going later in the game and this will probably be the last time i talk about split data without showing it it's not that i'm lazy i guess i feel like i'm saying that a lot it's just that the splits themselves aren't interesting i just want to tell you how far off bulbasaur is or like the the changes and how close we are to that pace but it's worth noting that the half sylph did cost us a ton of time and now it's pretty much back to dead even bulbasaur is about a minute 45 ahead of pace and I really just wanted to bring it up because it's really close still. But that's pretty much all we did the half seal for to get Swords Dance so that we can go get the speed badge boost, get this free experience from the poison tops. And that's just going to take us directly back into rival number five. Bulbasaur's pretty much at its full moveset for the entire run. And let's see if it's it's got what it takes. I spent the majority of the video kind of like downing Bulbasaur, but when you look at the totality of the run, this is where it really starts to shine and becomes actually a pretty good Pokemon. If there's anything you can't handle, you can just put it to sleep with Sleep Powder. So here I'm gonna set up one time, make sure I keep the bird to sleep, no sand attack, no super effective flying damage, take it out, nice, comfortable, full health. Now we're gonna level up, and this is where managing your experience and having things planned out really comes into play. It's because egg Execute's gonna come in, normally pretty annoying, right? But here, he's only gonna go for poison powder, just like we've seen on Erica. This means we can freely set up our next two swords dance here, and more importantly, that's gonna give us two badge boosts to our speed. And that, my friends, is what they call a wrap. Now we have 
six stage boosted attack and our little speed badge boost were just good enough to let us outspeed everything in this fight. There's no more risk. Bulbasaur, he can just go to town, body slam everything down, no repercussions. And we take this battle pretty convincingly. And I think you can kind of start to see the late game power kind of creeping in from a Pokemon that we were once worried about, oh, tackle it so slow. Now it's got the blueprint to pretty much handle any battle. So now we got a choice here. We got Sabrina, super effective psychic damage, or Blaine, fire damage. And I do what any self-respecting man would do in this situation. I go for a very brisk swim down to Cinnabar. When in doubt, go take a swim, brother. And there's not a whole lot to say about this section, except for one thing. We're gonna battle three gym trainers in Blaine's gym. And I just, I wanna just highlight this first battle. It was very frustrating. The idea is that the first three trainers in the gym all have pretty easy pass to victory. The first two have nine tails on the team, good experience. You can set up some swords dance. Don't even have to worry about the fire much. But in a case like this, you just have to set up a couple of times on the Growlithe. It's Growlithe, who cares, right? Well, turn one, critical hit Ember. That's bad enough on its own, but it burns me. Now I'm able to still get through this battle. No, Not really a problem, right? But the Growlithe hurts me so bad that at this point my option was to maybe use my very last full restore here but I have to backtrack and I have to go heal in Cinnabar and you might be saying that's not a big deal right well it, number one it wastes time number two my dig warp point is set in saffron so that I can get to Sabrina easier so this does waste quite a significant little bit of time and just like we saw like little other mistakes that have happened in this run little things that happen here and there that waste time the fact that we got lucky in a couple of spots like rival number two it just it outweighs everything and we're not done with the luck yet but little parts like this like sometimes i just want to be real with you guys sometimes stuff like this happens and if i'm doing like a real lifetime run i might just reset the entire run right here but i think when we get to the end of this run we'll see why sometimes it's important just to kind of play it out but after getting burned and crit there's really only one thing left to do we have to just take a deep reflective look inside of ourselves take a look in the mirror wipe away the the mist take a deep look in your own eyes right and ask yourself is tm28 actually tombstoner brother or is it just like a figment of your imagination because we may never know but what we do know is that it's time for Blaine as far as the Blaine master goes this is another spot where I had to take a risk Growlithe is cool Blaine doesn't have good AI so it'll just go for whatever so you could get lucky here and we do for the most part but for the second time in the run we see a Growlithe crit with Ember and it does a lot of damage but at this point we have set up to our plus six and we're gonna start the body slam party and you might be wondering what's the risk because you're gonna see me body slam the Growlithe the Ponyta the Rapidash they're all gonna go down because we outspeed but the risk here is that I level up right after the Rapidash this means that Arcanine will outspeed us and it's pretty much just up to luck Going for Sleep Powder is the safer play. We can tank one Ember, but our Sleep Powder misses, and we go down for the second reset of the run. Now, there's not much else to really cover for this fight. It's going to play out the same exact way, but this time Arcanine goes straight for that Fire Blast, but it misses. We connect with the Sleep Powder, and with the boost, we can two-shot the Arcanine. And now, there's pretty much only one place we can go, but first, I am going to take a little quick pit stop. We're going to pick up Mimic. It's going to be all important for this run, and that's going to take us straight in into Sabrina. And there's no real need for an introduction for her. It's pretty cut and dry. We have 91 speed. Kadabra has 90 speed. All by design. And I gotta tell you guys that Body Slam has about an 88% chance to one-shot it. And of course, I don't get the range here, which means I'm gonna take a side beam. It's gonna do a ton of damage. And things, they're not looking really good from the start. Nothing's going like the way I drew it up. So Mr. Mom comes in and I get kind of like a little happy accident here. I go for Body Slam. I didn't mean to. I need to set up two more times but what that does is paralyze it and what that amounts to is I get a fully paralyzed turn it uses light screen on another turn and when it finally does use confusion I'm set up fully which means I can survive even though I'm already low and just like we seen earlier on the fifth rival fight the speed badge boost are gonna come in clutch we have enough damage now to outspeed everything we can one-shot everything and a battle that was really hard on paper that didn't really go our way we took a lot of damage we didn't get the ranges we want but we still get out of here we got the seventh badge things are looking pretty good 
After the battle, I do use a single rare candy. It's very important for experience ranges for the next few fights. There's not really anything to talk about. There's no extra training in Giovanni's gym. And I think we can finish this little gym blitz that we've had going on straight into the eighth and final gym. Now with this one, I'm pretty sure if you really wanted to, you could just go straight Razor Leaf and be just fine. But I decided to set up just to make things a little bit safer because the run has been going pretty well up to this point. So I get to my plus six, I Razor Leaf the Rhyhorn, I Razor Leaf the Doug Trio, they go down easy enough. And the setup here was pretty much just for the Nidos. This allows us to get a really high percent chance one shot on both of them. The Nido Queen is a little bit more bulky, so I'm glad I hit it here, save a little bit of time. But at the end of the day, it's just right on sitting in the back. This thing's about to fold like a little piece of paper to these little sharp edged leaves. And that's the eighth badge down. There's nothing else to talk about and instead we can just jump straight into rival number six now. And everything's been pretty meticulously planned out from the rare candy usage to the extra trainers. And this is a good setup for us, despite having the top advantage in the lead. Pidgeot now has agility so we can use that as well. And that's what we see here. We do connect with the sleep powder and we don't want to set up for this fight right now anyway. So we got to do things the old fashioned way. We take it out slow and steady. Rhyhorn is next. You already know what a razor leaf is going to do to this thing. So let's move on. The important thing is that after it, we level up. That's exactly what we wanted. And just like in the rival number five fight, Execute's going to come in. It only goes for poison powder. So that means we get that full setup. Every little ounce of badge boosting that we have is going to stick. The speed's important. Even the special's pretty important in this fight. That sets us up in a very nice way just to body slam through everything. Gyarados goes down. Alakazam, we outspeed. See ya, bud. And at the end, it's Charizard. And something I overlooked for this fight is I just figured, hey, plus six on your attack, you outspeed it, easy, done deal. But that's not the case. There's only like an 11% chance the Charizard will go down in one hit. You pretty much got to crit. Or you just got to hit like the little tippy top ranges. We don't hit it here. And remember, as I'm playing this, I didn't know this. This, so it really surprised me and it goes for the flamethrower but like I said earlier this would normally just obliterate Bulbasaur but since we got some badge boost to our special from Blaine's badge that means we can't hang on that lets me put the finishing touches on the battle and now there's only one more destination my friends And while things have gotten a lot easier, you just saw that three Swords Dance can't one-shot something that I wouldn't consider bulky. And with Lorelai coming up, you know, we already know she's the queen of thick. To make sure we are where we need to be in terms of damage, I do pick up the final Rare Candy in Victory Road. We used one earlier, so I have 10 total. And I'm going to use six of those right here to hit an extra three damage rounding thresholds. So we're going to be level 58. Outside of that, there's no extra training and it's a straight line path to the end of the game. But now I'm finally actually going to bring up the split data I've been talking about so much. In the time I finished recording the last audio for the first 30 something minutes of the video to now, I think I redid my split graphic like five times. So here it is. This is almost the full picture without the final time. And let's kind of talk about where we're at. Now keep in mind the Elite Four start split at the bottom. It now officially records its data on the transition to Lorelai's room. And after being a little bit older, a little bit wider, Let's kind of interpret the data together. Now keep in mind that the tier pace, it's the pace for a flat 70 out of 100 rating. And you can see just how much Bulbasaur surpassed my pretty low expectations. Going into the Elite Four, we are a whopping 26 minutes and 35 seconds ahead of pace. So a Pokemon that I had a lot of complaints about early and just really didn't have a lot of faith in overall, it's actually crushing it. For future videos, let me explain that some Pokemon do things in a different order. It's kind of obvious, I guess. But it's why you're going to see the big fluctuation in things like Erika, Takoga, to Blaine here. But the important things to look at for the data will be the early and the late stuff. The first three or four splits, it can tell you a lot. But after that, Giovanni and the other final two splits still tell the tale. And the story that Bulbasaur's weaving looks like it could be like a Cinderella story. But I think there's only one way to find out. Lorelai's first, and the typical strat here would be to damage it, make it use rest, and then set up. But Bulbasaur has Sleep Powder, and it's the great equalizer. Level 58 here ensures that I can one-shot the Dugong after the setup, and once you get there, Razor Leaf can kind of take over for a bit. 
Cloyster only has defense, it goes down. Slowbro can take some hits, but good AI means that it's only gonna spam Amnesia. And the damage and speed boost, they let us easily handle the Jinx, but Lapras is kind of a bit of a coin flip. The odds are in my favor, but you just, you can't one shot it no matter what. You can play it safe, you can use sleep here, or you can do like I do, you can, you can just dare the computer to either crit you or freeze you in its one turn. But here, we just hit the paralysis, it misses its turn, and that's the battle over. So going into Bruno, I think I'm just gonna talk about Lorelai more. Now if you want me to just quickly summarize this fight, you can go straight Razor Leaf and be just fine. How fast this battle is kind of depends on the crits. You have a 70% chance and it doesn't go perfect here, but it is easy. But in Lorelai, the extremely simple answer to most problems you have with her is just to force Dugong to use Rest set up. I don't, I can't even count how many times that we've seen it on videos in my channel. And you know, I'm friendly with a lot of content creators. I watch a lot of other videos and I think it's just weird to see people, you know, tell me, hey, I watched the video and it was good. But when you watch their videos it's like they never even heard of that strategy and I'm confident in kind of saying this because those people never make it this far into the video anyway but you need to up your Lorelai game brothers for those of you still here don't do runs where you just look like a scrub on Lorelai I've given you the alley-oop I've just tossed it up there it's right there just dunk it but after the fight I used the four remaining rare candies and shout out to Razor Leaf everybody give a round of applause for Razor Leaf I really like using this move but it is time for Mimic to replace it we've seen the Ghastlies earlier they were a problem, so what's going to happen with a team of upgraded ghosts? Like Lorelai, the answer is pretty simple. Dream Eater. I think Dream Eater is pretty bad in general. It's kind of like Psychic if someone kind of beat it up with a baseball bat and threw it in a ditch, but for here, it is the best solution. With a reliable sleep move, it just kind of provides the solution to the Agatha equation, and that's just going to leave you with two variables. You need to connect with sleep, and you need to be able to outspeed. Two Swords Dance will give us the speed that we need, and with sleep, you just, you just let Jesus take the wheel. That's all there is to it. I know I didn't really do a play-by-play -play here, but... Agatha, she just swaps out early and that takes care of the speed part. And I don't really know what else to tell you other than that I connect with the sleep powder. Dream Eater just kind of takes care of the rest. This was a battle where just like the Zubat and Mount Moon, I kind of I've overthought it a lot. I tried a bunch of different things and I kind of I had to go back to my Bell Sprout route for the solution, but it's really simple, it's effective, and a battle that was pretty hard turns out to be pretty easy. With Lance, it's similar to how some of the rival fights went earlier. We have to take Gary out the old fashioned way because setting up now, it's a fool's errand. I do use sleep powder. I kind of smack it around a little bit. And then I take hyper beam because it's always fun to take hyper beam. I love doing it. And the reason that I'm not setting up here is you can see down that little XP meter down on the bottom. It's because I'm going to level up directly after. From there, this is one of those late game spots where poison actually becomes a really high tier defensive topping because the Dragonairs are only going to spam agility and just overall in this fight Aerodactyl was about the only thing that's actually able to do damage to us. This lets me set up the full complement of Swords Dance, it buffs up our little piece of lettuce and more importantly it puts us over 170 speed. Now from there I can just sit back, I can just let Hyper Beam take it, you got this bud. Plus 6 means that even resisted damage can actually one shot the rock bird and if he didn't stand a chance then come on you already know that the Dragonite is going to meet the same fate and Bulbasaur kind of killing it right now but there is one final battle left This is another risky battle, and I've talked about a few of them in the video, but it might seem crazy to not make the final battle consistent, but guys, you know me, look at the Parasect race. This is my style. I live and I die by the Alakazam brothers. I do mess up slightly here. I forget to set up one time, but I do correct it, and kind of Sleep Powder just keeps the super effective damage away. And now, let's talk about the risk some risk evaluation. I don't outspeed Alakazam here, but one Swords Dance will one-shot it. You could take a move like Recover or Psychic, but it's just really risky. More risk than it already is because you're gonna see me get plowed by a regular non-crit side beam for like 60% of my health. And to add insult to injury, I get confused. Things are looking bad, but I do get the body slam off. And I wouldn't say I'm confident here, but like always, we just play it out. And I'm gonna make the executive decision just to go off script here. Now think back to rival number five. Think back to that Charizard surviving the body slam. Well, there are a lot of ranges here that aren't great, and I'm missing a lot of help. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna set up my final swords dance, and I'm actually gonna fish for a Leer or Tail Whip on Rhydon to get one additional boost, so I'm not gonna use Sleep Powder. The plan was always to mimic Tail Whip and soften it up so I could use body slam 
them on it. But keeping it awake, which is the new thing I just thought of on the fly, things get a little chippy, they get a little close. Remember that I was still confused, so I avoid hitting myself, which is great. It would assuredly be a reset. And just look at the footage. It takes so long to actually get a tail whip to land. This thing's just not doing it. We're getting chipped down. We're in the red health. It's just, it's either missing or just going for other stuff. But eventually we get it, and that's really all we need. With six stages of lowered defense, we can actually one-shot the Rhino with a body slam. And even though you guys might not be able to to see it yet this one it's already over and let me just talk about the badge boost glitch it's just it's one of my favorite things in any game ever it's just a it's really fun it's a fun mechanic for me it's really insane if you think about it this way before that tail whip i had a 30 percent chance to one shot a 35 percent chance to one shot and a 70 percent chance to one shot the last three pokemon respectively but that one little teeny tiny tail whip it gave us that 12.5 percent boost to attack and it means all those numbers are now 91 one 0.2% chance, which means the only way we can fail here is if we crit. And I know I didn't really commentate the rest of the battle, but I did cover what was important. I felt like the one-shot ranges and the tail whip giving you the numbers was the important part. And the last thing I'll say is, I just, I never get tired of seeing like a low, weak base stat Pokemon pre-evolved just sitting there bulldozing its direct counter for a one-shot in the final moments of the run. And that's the run over. Or is it? Because you see guys, as I was editing and I almost had this video done to completion, the post Brock all the way up to the SSN, it just kind of got under my skin and I wasn't happy with it. So I dove back in to sort of analyze things a bit. And it might sound weird since it would just be really easy just to finish the video, brush it off, not worry about it. But that's just, it's not my MO. I don't make content and videos for a living and I don't make content just to kind of fuel the YouTube machine. I don't care about the money from this. I make content because I just enjoy making making really good Pokemon runs. And this one just, it felt like there was a lot left on the table despite maybe the layman thinking that, hey, it was a pretty good run. So with that out of the way, the idea was to take a page out of my Smeargle race route. It was to kind of overlevel early and hopefully have like a smoother ride during the awful tackle segment that I complained about so much. It all starts right here with some extreme light years grinding here. I go all the way up to 16. And when we're done with that, that bloats the Brock split a lot. And then I fight pretty much everything up to and into Mount Moon. And this is going to get me to level 25 after Misty. And I'm going to use two rare candies to get me access to a much earlier Razor Leaf. And this made, it made things feel really good. I mentioned earlier that rival number two was pretty much the hardest fight in the game to me. And you can see the improvement. And overall, I was really happy with it. The main trade-off here was that you lost some levels in the late game, but I did make it work. And you'll see here that I had a pretty huge improvement. The final time for this one was two hours, 56 minutes, and it was pretty good. But this right here, my friends, this is why split data is so important. When I was just looking over the data, the improvements were mainly from better play and the bloated early game was barely a factor. So once again, I kind of wiped the slate clean and I went back to the drawing board. So this time I skipped the early bug catchers and I essentially did the same exact Brock split that I did before. I don't have resets on here. I forgot to put them up, but I did track them. We'll talk about that at the end. And I will say that going to the light years junior trainer is extremely difficult at level eight. And I did have to reset a few times to get the run I wanted. But overall, this actually gave me a minute improvement over my fastest Brock split. From there, I still pick up a lot of extra trainers at Mount Moon, and rather than be level 25 after Misty, I just gutted it out against rival number two. I did take a sand attack, but I slogged through it on my first try, and this is where I hit level 25 now. This gives me access to Razor Leaf, and overall it only cost about three minutes over the fastest split that I had. The extra levels, it made things feel really good, and this route doesn't really differ too much from there, but a crucial decision I made down the line this time was to cut Cut out the Sylph trainers, the Blaine Gym trainers, and pretty much anything extra that I did. I still pick up the Tamers and Koga's Gym to get my experience where I need it to be, and ultimately I'm going to have three resets in this run. One's going to be on Sabrina, I have one to Agatha, and there's one on the Champion. But you can see right here when we clock in, Bulbasaur is going to finish this run with a 2 hour, 48 minute, and 56 second time. This is a flat 16 minute improvement off of the original time, and I have to admit it now, after doing so many runs, Bulbasaur is actually pretty good. This would give a little tier card rating of 84.97, and I'm extremely happy and satisfied with that time. No need to do any more Bulbasaur runs. I thought initially three hours and four minutes was pretty good, but my spotty senses were kind of tingling, and I just, I knew there was some gas left in the tank, and I think the results kind of speak for themselves. You can see on the updated split data that this is just, is better in every aspect outside of the slot bloat and the misty split, and this, along with runs like Smeargle, it just shows the power of early leveling. Now, if it's not clear, the tier 
texture paste here is the split difference between the first bubble sword run that we watched in the video and the final one that we're going to use the, for the tier card rating and there's just there's something really like innately satisfying about how each split has like an incremental decrease i love it so let's get that updated tier list scrolling across the screen so you can look at it and let me give some final thoughts and i really want to talk about venusaur that was the run that i was originally going to do but bulbasaur it sounded fun i made some changes at the last minute and it really was fun i enjoyed it we haven't done squirtle yet and i do plan to before the end of the year maybe hopefully don't hold me to it i want to get those out of the way before i hit the final stage of the starters but i don't think there's going to be like a real surprise like we saw here today both charizard and blastoise they get key things that kind of upgrade them over their previous stages while venusaur it's essentially just like a higher stat bulbasaur that learns moves later for example it learns sleep powder at the ridiculous level of 55 but i guess we'll just have to play the run for ourselves and find out how it plays but all i'm saying is that it's going to be really hard to top charizard's run special shout out to my channel members and patreons the support means a lot and if you made it through this one you're a real one and comment that down below i didn't mean for this video to be this long but like i always say the video is as long as it takes whether it be a 20 minute stomp of the game or something that takes an hour and needs some more explaining and details the extra runs were kind of impromptu but it needed to be done and i think that's about all there is left to say i appreciate you guys for sticking around this long check out the playlist check out the lives if you want to know over the tier list they're really good to watch and i'll just i'll see you on the next video bye